I'm Kyle Malnati, your host of the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. At Calibrate, we exist to help people create generational wealth through real estate. My personal mission is to encourage, empower, and educate you by sharing best practices from business leaders that are proven winners. Broadcasting from the Mile High City, thank you for tuning in to episode 141 of the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Malnati. Our gracious expert guest is a returning guest. We've got Kira Golden, who if you are one of the podcast OGs, you know her from episode 18, Investing in Your Financial Goals. Kira is a past client. We worked on a deal about two and a half years ago, about the same age as her most recent son, Keegan. She's also got Cal, who's five now. Kira, welcome back to our show. Thank you. Good to see you again. Good to be back. So great to see you on Zoom. And for those that may not know this, I mean, you hear it in the podcast intro at Calibrate Real Estate, we exist to help people create generational wealth through real estate. That's our mission and our vision. We exist to help people create generational wealth through real estate. And I know that Direct Source Wealth, your company, is all about that. And we've had a long yep. discussion for many, many years about differentiating ourselves from other real estate investment companies. And that's what you do at Direct Source Wealth. In our episode 18, you had mentioned to me that your objective is to raise awareness of the industry and create a professional platform. You work with local area operators in a variety of real estate segments. You actually co-GP with them and partner with them to allow investors to build a diversified portfolio. That's a mouthful but really the yeah. reason why you said that last time was that you felt like in the last downturn, call it, you know, about 12 years ago, that people really got disconnected from their investments. They may mm -hmm. own a mutual fund and only know two or three of the stocks that are actually in the mutual fund. And, you know, prospectus is 60 pages or a hundred pages. And so when you talk to people about direct source wealth, you've mentioned to me that you avoid this fund model and that direct source investing is, is your preference. And that's why you named the company that way. So for those yeah. that don't know what direct source investing is, what's that all about? Yeah. I'm, I mean, the whole idea is that you pick a specific project or a specific investment that you invest in. And, and I'll tell you actually in the last couple of years, that approach has really paid off. Um, so my thinking is when a mutual fund starts to tank and you freak out because the value is going down and you don't know what the value is. When someone's trying to, you know, invest in a mutual fund, the value goes down and they don't, you know, they, all they see is their statement with the value going down. They want to sell. They want to get out. They're making a strictly emotional decision. Um, with direct investments, if an investor has concerns, one of my favorite things to say is, look, let's buy a plane ticket. I'll meet you out there. Let's go walk the property. Let's go see that there's still 96% occupancy, that people are still paying their rent. That, and it just helps people to stay the course, to be directly invested. And this theory is bigger than just real estate, uh, although we focus on real estate. You know, it's like, it's the same thing. If you're invested in a local restaurant or a local company and you can go there and you can talk with the owner, it, like investing used to be about people putting their money in things they believed in. And somewhere along the way, it just became about getting a return. And obviously you need to get a return. That's part of the theory. But the idea is that when you're direct investing, you're actually connected to the impact you're making. And that helps everybody stay the course through hard times and get to the other end in a, in a win that works for everybody. Because that whole idea of like, it's not personal, it's business. To me, that, that's just like such a terrible, terrible phrase. Um, it is personal. I completely agree with you, especially on that phrase. I've had a few people say that to me, and it's always kind of as they're walking out the door or about to do something really crummy to you yeah. that they say, yeah. you know, it's nothing personal. This is just business. It's like, no, you're just really a jerk. Um, yeah. <laughs> a side note, though, is that your, your statement there reminded me of a book that I read. I got it from my grandmother, actually, called The Snowball, which is a story about an interview of Warren Buffett. And it talks about how Warren Buffett of Berkshire Hathaway and Charlie Munger will actually go out to the companies that they invest in and really get heavily invested in what they're doing. And that's why they've been so successful. And I think as we've got this 
economy that you have the ability to be invested in so many different things and not go out to that. It's convenience and it's efficiency, but what ends up happening is people get really detached from what they're investing in. Absolutely. Which leads to strictly emotional behavior with no, you know, you need that relationship to temper your thinking. Yes. And you had mentioned to me in the past that connecting people to their investments was really important to you and that making a difference with the tenants in their property and the community around it. And you really started doing that before the buzzwords of impact management or impacting investing came about. Um, And you shared with me that good investing is about making a difference and that ends up helping the bottom line. And so how do you link that with your direct source investors that you work with about helping them feel really, really truly connected to the community or to the project that they're in? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's, it's very similar. And I'll say like, I didn't obviously do this with this intention in mind, but navigating through COVID, I was so grateful for the approach that we've taken with our tenants and the communication and the relationships we've built because we, a couple of our assets had the best collection months ever in the middle of COVID. Um, And even where we had to make workout plans and whatnot, we were able to do that um, because of the communication and because people knew we were invested in them. Um, And similarly, I'll talk about a recent example. We had some, some juvenile delinquents go in and damage a number of apartment units we just renovated right before, literally like a day before the CO inspection. And, you know, our approach is, you know, we, we hired private security, we got them found, we got them arrested. The police didn't want to arrest them. We tallied up all of the cost of the damage that they did. You know, the broken windows, the paint on the carpet, the, the lost occupancy rent because we couldn't rent the units out. And now we're using a restorative approach you know, we were, at least we're, we're trying to, we're working on this, of, of getting them to, whether it's pick up trash around the property or come out and swing a hammer or do something so that they can actually, like my belief is that they probably really don't understand the cost of the damage they're doing and also don't understand that they could do something proactive that can help everyone. So we do that. And I think that our, and, and we share that. We share that on Facebook with our private investor group. They know what's going on. They, they get pictures and updates. And I think that also helps with the direct investment. You know, if you, you know, when you go, it's great to go somewhere and, and have 10% of what you buy going to charity. I, I love when organizations do that. And we have a nonprofit now down here in Puerto Rico that uh, they're not my nonprofit, but that it's the one that I support. That's all about, um, you know, local give back and entrepreneurialism and helping people recover and get back on their feet after the hurricane and job training and all of these things that are really important. And, you know, we give to them out of everything that we do going forward. Um, but it's different. It's different to have a percent of something you buy at Walmart donated and, and then actually knowing that you're, you own an asset and you're making decisions based on making a difference in the lives of the people who are living in your properties. It's so interesting that you share that perspective because you're right. When you're directly involved in something, whether it be an investment or a charitable effort, you feel it. There's five senses, there's 360 degrees around you. And the best way that I can share that is I had the blessing of being able to go on a mission trip to Juarez, Mexico last year. And that experience of meeting the family that we built a house for, actually two houses, Mm. I was focused on this one house, the other group was focused on this other, but we all came together and blessed the house and stocked it. And I mean, it was like extreme home makeover of these very small, humble homes that were basically a 450 square foot tough shed, but we framed it in and and insulated it and sheetrocked it. And um, we also mudded it and painted it, which a lot of people don't do. A lot of people just kind of frame it and go. Um, And that's certainly better than really the pallet houses that a lot of these these people will have in some of these third world areas or, or very poor areas. And I felt so connected to what I was doing. And as at that time I had been in real estate for 15 years, I had never felt that connected with someone's domain and home. Even yeah. though I walk property, you know, in the in the apartment or in the residential side of the business, you're walking people's homes every day, whether they're a tenant 
or an invest, uh, they're an investor that you're walking their, their rental property, or it's actually a homeowner, but it's still, it just didn't feel as connected as actually building someone's property. And so kudos to you and being able to take maybe a negative situation with the vandalism and saying, you know, guys, here's some community service that you can do to pour right back into what you damaged. And uh, it's just another great example of helping people be connected to what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. So the next thing I've got to talk about is how this, e how this, not this email, how this interview came about. It came about because of an email and it's, we chuckled about it as we were preparing, but one of our most popular episodes this year was a COVID related what's going on in the apartment industry. And it wasn't an interview that I did. It was actually an interview that business Denver did biz den and they had a panel of people in the multifamily industry. And, and of course, because that's the majority of the property that I've sold for my career, that struck a nerve for all of my clients in the month of May in 2020, where it's like, what is going on? And your email to me was amazing. You sent an email to me to the effect of, if you want a female's perspective, or if you want a woman's perspective on this, a female voice on these discussions is specifically what you said, I'm available, smiley face. And I love that you said that, I think that you had mentioned to me that the reality of more men working in the field of investing in real estate is a differentiator for you. And so let's talk about that concept of what your female lens is and also how sometimes that's been kind of a negative thing where capital partners or other people may have not wanted to work with you because of the way you look or the way you dress or, or some of the statements that you might make. And so let's talk about just that whole concept of being different and differentiating yourself and um, yeah. how this is a male dominated world really uh, of yeah. real estate investing. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, you say different differentiating and it's funny how like being different is sort of seen as a negative and yet you go into a marketing conversation and everyone talks about differentiating and there is this fine line about authentically being who you are without being so about who you are, so self-obsessed and self-focused that people who aren't like you don't feel comfortable working with you, right? Like, I, so I, I hadn't thought about this much before in those terms until you said it that way, but it, it really is true. And, you know, whether it's gender or race or education or vocabulary, or I mentioned to you, someone when I was door knocking for Edward Jones said, you know, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, I, you seem lovely and smart, but I'd never work with someone with a nose ring, you know? And I'm like, okay, like, what do you say to that? You know, <laughs> like, okay. Um, you know, and I've had people say, I, I won't work with women. I won't invest with women. Um, you know, and I, I share that not to say, not to put a chip on my shoulder or try to say like, go women, you know, there, there are more men who do this business. Um, and so naturally, uh, people tend to invest with people like themselves. That's all great. I don't think that's a problem. Um, but at the end of the day, I also think that I bring a lens that differentiates myself. And, you know, when I'm pushing a stroller around one of my properties with my kids, there isn't a person on that asset that thinks I'm the principal. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, a lot of times, even my property managers or staff, you know, you'll hear them whisper, do you know that's the owner? You know, they don't realize I'm just a, a sponsor. I'm not the owner of the whole thing. But, you know, you hear that. Um, I'll have tenants sit down. In fact, I was at one of our assets. I was sitting in a, a common area and I was just talking with one of the old men that lived there. And he was pouring off my ear about the place and not in a positive way. And I know if I was sitting there, in a three-piece suit, looking like the banker that owned the property, I would not get that feedback that was really valuable for us improving how we operate that asset. Um, so there's a, there's a level at which I can gain information, I can uh, move more nimbly because people aren't distancing themselves from me. Um, I also think that women tend to be more interested in investing and building relationships. And so, you know, I have one lender that I've worked with forever on everything. And, you know, I, at one point considered trying someone else, you know, stepped out on the relationship. And I was like, I'm never doing that again. You know, <laughs> went back. I'm like, you're reliable. I always know everything's going to happen. Same with my insurance guy. And so we build, you know, really good relationships where I know the names of their kids. When their third child was born, I'm sending them the 
you know, baby wise, you know, children's series. And, you know, that when, when we get in a pinch or when, for example, on one of our assets, cash flow got really tight for a whole year and I couldn't pay the insurance premium. My guy was like, I got you covered. Like, I know you'll navigate through this. I know you'll get through it. When you do, you'll catch up. And like, I, I feel like whether it's my gender or just who I am as a person or really at the end of the day, the whole package, knowing who you are and focusing on leveraging who you are rather than focusing on how you're different and how that might make you not have a seat at the table um, makes all the difference. And those other voices, those other thoughts are really valuable. And I find that even people who don't look or act or think like me in general are absolutely willing to consider and see that we're better together. We're better with the things that they can bring to the table and the things that I can because I'm different from them. I'm glad that you shared the cash flow crunch because that happens. That's a, that's a part of many real estate investors or business owners, you know, being a business owner myself, that's something that we all experience and we learn from that. And you've shared that you've had lots of different experiences. I remember in our past episode back in 2018, you had shared that uh, you had this situation where you had a rental house, you were in the middle of a divorce and you had a rental house and across the street, and I <laughs> yeah. might botch this, but you know, the, the house was for sale across the street. It had an extra bedroom and a pool and it was on the market for like 30,000 bucks and, and you were into the other one for 130 or something. Something like that. Yeah. It was like, yeah, little, little, yeah. You, close, very close. Yeah. So I asked this of our last guest, Tyler Chesser, who is the host of the Elevate podcast and is a commercial realtor, a CCIM in Kentucky. He's now in the process of creating partnerships and, and, and uh, working through funding deals in the Southeast area of the United States. And I asked him this question, I said, you know, do you ever worry about losing investors money? And his response to me was, of course, I think that you would be completely detached from reality if that wasn't a concern of yours. And I know that if you're doing this, especially with a direct investor, not, you know, some big fund, but a direct investor, how do you navigate that discussion of expectations yes. and, and yes. what things look like? Oh, that is such a great question because I've had a lot of learning on this topic the last couple of years. Um, and there's a couple of things I would say to people. Number one, um, I'll use an example of an, a project we have over a hundred investors in that we had to restructure um, it, it's now, thank God, like turning the corner, we're about to refinance out of the debt, like things are going well, but we would not be here if the investors on our, didn't have faith in us and let us restructure and let us get through it. Like if they had come at us with a hard line and tied everything up in legal, it would have been a very different outcome, right? So their faith in us, I am humbled by and appreciate. Having said that, um, I had a call in June with the majority of the investors and one gentleman in particular, um, and I have about three of them on this particular deal, are just self-entitled, angry people. And, you know, it, I was terrified. I was terrified to have an open, transparent investor call where I knew this guy was going to try to incite a riot. <laughs> and what I got instead because of my commitment to transparency and my commitment to taking things head on was so beautiful. All the other partners on the deal stood up and said, look, we're not thrilled with how this is going either. We had to do the restructure too. We get it, but you're, you're out of line. Right. And what I, what I've learned is that that the whole thing about outliers, you've got, you know, you've got a few people who are going to be like your advocate, no matter what happens, you know, that you could really royally screw up and they're all, maybe like your mom and your dad, you know, like they're going to always speak on your behalf. And then you're going to have some people who are just angry, no matter what you do, right? The other extreme, it, it doesn't matter how elegantly you handle a situation or whatever, if things don't go exactly how they think they should go, whether or not that's even how you promised it or managed expectations or anything, it's like, whatever they decided in their head, if you don't do it, they're going to be angry. And the majority of people are actually really amazing, really rational, really thoughtful, good actors. And I think that if you can be transparent and then 
be humble. And, and I turn to my investors whenever we have challenges come up, I'm very open. Hey, here's what we're dealing with. Here's how I'm thinking we're going to solve the problem. Let's do a poll. Let's do a vote. How should we handle this? And I'd say 80% of the ideas we do are my execution. And that's my job. I'm supposed to be the answer person and figure out how to solve things. But 20% are there either their ideas or their reframing of how I was thinking or the way they asked a question that made me think of a different answer. And so that engagement, um, to me, I don't, I don't think of what I do as me offering a deal and other people just writing a check and waiting for me to do my thing. It truly is co-investment. And their, their main emphasis is capital. My main emphasis is operations. But we're engaging constantly because ultimately we're in this together. And, and I have seen that help us navigate through some challenging times. And, you know, we're not even through all of them yet, but like, it, it, it's, it's been amazing. And it's helped me start to do a new thing, which is having been in real estate for a long time, I've never been in a situation where I've lost a hundred percent of my money. I've lost money in deals, but I'd never lost a hundred percent. Right. And so in my mind, I truly don't believe that you could make an investment in real estate and wipe out right? Like I, I just, that's not something that seems real to me, but having gone through some challenges where, where passive investors who don't have a lot of control over a deal in their minds, they start to think my value is completely gone. And they start operating from that position of a total wipeout. It made me realize that now when we do new uh, conversations with new potential partners, we really focus a lot of the conversation on what happens if this money goes to zero? And sometimes that's even a multiple callback conversation where I come back and I say, hey, let's do the exercise. Like, what if I called you right now and said that money you just wired? What if I said it's gone? What, what happens to your ability to pay for your kid's college education? What happens to your retirement? Like, can you really navigate that? And that's something that I've always been thoughtful of. Like you said, if, if you're, you're, you always have to be worried about, you know, what happens with people's money. But now I'm also realizing that I need to almost facilitate for them the experience of having a loss as a mental exercise so that they can really be calibrated to that decision before they make a commitment. Um, and then the other thing is keeping dry powder or keeping like in my case, my advisory board and some of my closer investors available. Um, if there are people who you want to get out of your group because they're not in alignment with the thinking of the group, to have the ability to do that. Um, but I think that's really, really important um, because, you know, you just, you don't, you don't want people in who are going to ruin it for everybody when you're in a tenuous moment. You know, you want people who are going to be creative problem solvers. There are so many amazing pieces of advice in, in your answer. And it reminds me of something that you said to me in the past. You had said to me that thinking about problems a different way as opportunities actually makes you stronger and that the opportunities that you face are what provides you with strength. And so what have you learned, you know, just throughout working with some amazing people to be a, yeah. direct, a direct investor, a direct source wealth investor, you've got to have been you know, real successful in your life. They're, these are business yeah. people that come to you that say, yep. I don't want to deal with working on the investment. I, don't, it, well, I want it to be passive. I don't want anything to do with it, but I want to understand it and I want to be connected to you. So what have you learned from some of these people that become your partners? And, and how is that yep. special relationship galvanized for you? Yeah, I, I've learned a lot from them. And I would say, you know, some of that is on the investment side, but most of it is on the personal growth and development side, um, you know, to just uh, one big one is that, you know, the kind of people who do what, what, I, what we do, what I do, we tend to think we know a lot. We tend to think we know how to do pretty much everything, let's be honest. And um, when we don't know, there's sometimes this tendency to not want anyone to know we don't know. <laughs> and my, my partners have really helped me in my core come to understand that not only is it okay to not know things, it is okay to tell people you don't know things and to 
open yourself up and be vulnerable and, and let them help you solve the problems. And the faster you do that, the better everybody wins. Um, and so that translates to business, but it, it comes first from really just on a personal front, having that, that co quiet confidence. The other big thing, um, you know, we, you're a person of faith and like, I've always been, you know, I've been a Christian for 20 years, but in the last five, God has really been like, I don't even have words. Um, but I'll just give an example. We have a project down here in Cabo Rojo in Puerto Rico that in my mind was a vacation rental. That was the best use of it. Cabo Rojo is a hot vacation point. It's like, you know, the tourist destination. And yet, and we own half the complex. And the other half of the complex is loan, owned by local Puerto Ricans primarily as a second home. Only about five people really live at the property of 70 units. And um, I have been fighting, battling with the HOA, who in my opinion has done some very illegal things, including like not counting our votes and just dismissing us and having private meetings and whatnot. And, um, but I've been fighting them head on. And in December, we made a big play to like bring a bunch of people down and vote and take over the HOA and push this vacation rental concept that was my concept. And we lost. We lost because they literally just refused to count the votes of all the people there. And our only option at that point is to go to court. And that's very expensive and cumbersome and et cetera. And so I went into prayer about it. And what was interesting is like, this scripture of like from glory to glory came up and I realized I was like, I am trying to force my will on this situation, on these people, on everything. And it's not my will. It's his will that I'm here to serve. So I'm going to stop fighting. Like I've given it my all. The sign is clear. They're not going to listen to you. I'm going to stop fighting. And we pivoted and we turned these into long-term rentals and section eight rentals. So by February, and maybe you can get where this story is going now. By February, we no longer had vacation rentals in Cabo Rojo, Puerto Rico. We had a property manager and we were leasing up long-term rentals. And then COVID. Tourism was shut down. Puerto Rico was on lockdown. Nobody's traveling. Airbnb rentals are pivot, you know, tanking. And, and we're signing leases. And so, you know, whether it's my investment partners or my big partner in the sky, like the, the biggest lesson I have is to listen hard to others and really get in the flow of what is best for each asset, what is meant to happen there, you know, the course of events that's going to have the least amount of conflict. Now, that doesn't mean I can't put on my armor and go to battle when that's the right thing to do. I can and I will. But sometimes it's like, you just listen. And I could have been right and I could have gone to court and I probably would have won. But would I really won? Because we would have had Airbnb short-term rentals <laughs> and investment God only knows how much more money. So, you know, and literally God knows how much more money we would have invested. <laughs> and instead, like the, the assets going the right direction in the midst of COVID. And so there really is this big thing of recognizing that I am only here uh, as hands and feet to serve others, to serve my partners, to serve the greater good. And when I'm conscious of that, and when I'm doing that, the way gets paved and things go right. And then when I start to think I'm the smartest girl in the room and I know the answer and I know the solution, that's when things spin out. So that's the biggest thing I've learned. And that's like, it's made a huge difference and, and in just even the quality of life and, and you know, our investor partnerships and, and everything. Amen, sister. I, I am so <laughs> thankful that you share your faith and that you share that. And I've had so many of my other friends on this podcast that have been guest experts that have shared that, look, we may not share, not you and I, but someone that you're interacting with may not share in the secular world, in the business world, the same faith application, the same way of doing faith. But for the most part, people really appreciate people that have Judeo-Christian values because they that means that they're generally going to get someone that's ethical. It's not always the case, but, but sure. generally. And just the principles of that faith and what I know as a business owner, 
that operating a brokerage company for the past three and a half years has been far more difficult than being an individual broker at another company or at several other companies throughout my career. And it really tests your faith. And there have been many times, and I, I, I really do not say this to overstate, to exaggerate, this is not hyperbole. I have literally been on my knees yeah. on my butt in a supply closet at my original <laughs> startup office saying, God, I do not know what to do. I'm yeah. so either frustrated with this situation or the money is dried out and I have a big old five figure tax bill that I don't know what to do with. And God shows up when, when you yeah. ask and thank goodness um, you had this situation where you're like, this HOA is being this huge pain and I could sue him, but you know what? Let's probably just pivot this and, and this may make more sense. And all of a sudden, you know, with hindsight's 2020, you realize, wow, that was an amazing situation. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I have to, I have to notice, I was listening the entire time, the past five years, you were saying, and, and I just have to put a segue into this. Cal, your son, who I've met before at our closing, when I was helping you in the process of purchasing a property, Cal is now five. Yeah. And you had shared with me as we were preparing for this, that Cal is in the process of starting his own investing journey out of five. But yeah. now you've also got Keegan, who is two and a half. You were pregnant with Keegan at the time we did our last interview. So I, I've got to talk just about what's it, what it's like having two kiddos running this big, successful investing business. Um, obviously, tell me a little bit, tell our audience, tell us about what it's like to have an investor at five years old. What's Cal up to? He's so cool. <laughs> He's so cool. He's the coolest person I know. Um, yeah, so I just hired help for the first time. So I'm a single mom and I was bound and determined to be stay-at-home mom and run my company. And I've done that for the last five years. And a month ago, I hired... Um, because of lockdown and homeschooling and all of that, I hired a teacher to come to that, who lives with us now and helps out. And I have no clue, honestly, how I did it before. I, I could not even tell you because like, I cannot even think about going back. To, to, I mean, they just came with me to everything, every meeting, every, you know, so, you know, what that's turned into is like you were saying, my five-year-old, like he go, gets up and he checks his YouTube channel, his toy review channel and sees if he's getting new followers and if he's getting new likes. And when he gets a new toy, he, um, you know, wants to wait to open it until I can get the camera rolling, you know, and, um, and it's adorable. And, and now it's recently parlayed into, he wanted a toy store and, you know, things, pieces of the puzzle fall into place. And a friend of mine is building a, a nonprofit, a, a children's museum here in San Juan. And I approached him and I said, you know, can, can my son run your, your toy store? You know, could he lease the space for you and all that? And the guy said, yes. And he came over and I, they went and sat in the, the grown up room, the negotiating room in the house and, and Cal did his pitch. And I was sitting back in the corner in the chair. I wasn't involved. I was just sitting there. And my friend looks at me, he goes, this is serious. Like, he really wants to do this. Like, like he's, and I said, yeah. And, and he goes, all right. Then we have to talk about like, you know, what are the profit splits? What are the capital contributions? He starts looking at me and I'm like, I'm like, it's his, it's his Coverdell account. It's his college fund that he's going to be using to, you know, buy merchandise and pay rent. So you got to talk to him, <laughs> you know, like, and, uh, you know, it is, it's, it's, it's funny watching him make these decisions. Cause a lot of times when people say, Oh, you know, my five-year-old owned a piece of real estate or this or that, like, you know, the parents doing it. And, and that's great. Cause the kid's still learning watching. Like I'm not, that's not to diminish it. Um, but it's, it's really funny. You know, he has this whole idea. He said, I want to, I want to give away a toy. When, and so that kids come into the store and, and this will reveal to you, he's got me wrapped around his finger. Cause he goes, once you get the parent in the store, they're going to buy something. Like, oh God, you know, like, I don't know if all parents are this way, but you know your mother. And, um, you know, so he said, you know, we'll, we'll set up something where kids go on an app through each area of the museum and they, um, you know, follow and, uh, and track and then they come into the store to get their prize, you know, and that'll get them in the store. And then I want to sell educational toys and, and I'm going to, on his YouTube channel, he wants to show people how to do the educational toys because he said a lot of kids are homeschooling. So they could buy the toy at the store or order it online and then go on his YouTube channel and watch how to do it. And like, he like, like, this is him. These are his ideas. And, and this guy is just looking at him and, and me, like, I know what I'm talking. I'm like, this is not me. I don't know. Like, 
but I guess that's the advantage of, you know, the last five years of his life. He's been on every airplane with me at every hotel, walking every property, going to every meeting. And, um, you know, so he's just, he's just doing it and it's fun. I mean, it's a game for him. You know, it's like, he, he's got a good heart about it. Oh, that's so cool. And it's so true because I'm sitting at a closing at Stuart title with you, you know, three years ago and he's there and he's playing around and, you know, he's younger, of course, at the time. And this is before Keegan because Keegan was in, was in the belly at the time, you know, and, and it's just so neat to see your kids. And I've got three that are all elementary school age now to see them operating in an area that they find interesting to them and, and yeah. really honing their craft. And, you had sort of teased this to me as we were preparing, but I was like, I don't, I don't want to hear about this because I want it to happen live. And I had written a note down. I feel like it's maybe divine intervention here that two of my last questions sort of talk about the subject of trying and failing and then, you know, achieving after that failure and learning. And, and I've, there's been a lot of personnel related failure for me as a business owner where it's like, ah, oh, it just crushes me to see these relationships kind of move and go. And, I wrote down something that you had shared with me and it links up into these last two questions. So if you're ready for it, here we go. So Let's do it. you had shared that there is no better time to take significant risk when you're really young. And this is as you were embarking on being an investor. If you play hard and screw up really bad when you're 20, you'll be no worse than anyone else because a lot of people don't even start their journey until they're, you know, later off in life. And, and this is advice that you wish you knew when you were 22, right? And, and my way of framing this is this application of a song, which is called Dear Younger Me. And the writer oh, yeah. of the song shares that they have all this advice for themselves when they were younger. I'm going to ask you to flip this question a little bit because now you've got two sons and you've got one son that's, that's actively involved in his kind of investment or craft journey here with the toy store and toy reviews and all of that on the YouTube channel. So if you had to impart some advice on your kiddos, now that you've lived some life and work with some major investors, what would the advice you would give to younger people be? That shouldn't be a hard question, but, but, I struggle with advice because each of us has our own individual journey and who we are. Like if somebody tells me how to handle a situation and I go do it their way, it may or may not pull off the way it would for them because I'm different. Um, so I think my overarching piece of advice would just be to authentically find your identity and I'm going to add the spiritual piece to this. Like I authentically find your identity in Christ, in your maker, however you conceive of that. I mean, I have my belief of what that is, but you know, I think there's room for people to, however they conceive of that, but find your identity in your maker, meaning outside of yourself, right? So much of new age stuff is like going inward and figuring out who you want and what you want to manifest in life and what you want to be. And it's all self, 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 self. And I think we've lost what it is to find your identity outside of yourself. So, you know, find your identity outside of who you are and serve that with every fiber of your being. And I'll just say like, for me, that really came to a head because following a pretty ugly custody battle, I ended up in a, in a private SEC audit. And I have my beliefs about how that came to be. And I, I don't think it had anything to do with my investors. But, um, but it was scary. Uh, it is scary. We're still going through it. It's scary. And um, there was a moment where I thought, you know, I'm just going to get out of the business. I've got enough money. I, this risk isn't worth it. It's not worth it. The stress to my kids. I don't want anything to do with this. And the thing that sustained me, so still sustains me through that, is that I know that this is my calling and that I have a big service to do for others and that it would be selfish to quit. And I could, I could just go live with whatever money I have and it's plenty and it would last my life and like, we'd all be fine. But, um, but I was like, no, I'm going to, I'm charging forward and not only I'm, I'm doubling down, like I'm going harder and faster and I'm going to use every moment and everything as an opportunity to learn and grow and do better. And, um, yeah. So, 
I guess that's the only advice. And then, you know, then, then that should give you what you need to navigate each individual situation. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's amazing. And so I have two great reflections on that answer. I love it. And then we'll get to our final question. So on my keychain here, and this was given to me by a friend, I've got the scriptural uh, quote here, scriptural verse of uh, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's just yeah. such an amazing reminder that if you think you can't do it, and the second part of, of what my reflection is, is that I have had many people that I admire say, stop playing the small game. And, yeah. and when you think about the service of others, that is what gets you out of bed when you don't want to, because we all have these moments where we're like, ah, it doesn't matter or whatever. And, and when everything is easy, when everything is small, when everything is confined, you're not stepping into your calling because your yes. calling is difficult and it's what you're here it should to be. be for. Yep. It should be. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Final question. Yeah. Now this is a question I didn't ask you before because uh, this, this answer didn't exist in the, in the, meaning that it does today. So before you were interviewed on episode five, I interviewed my career coach, Chris Oakley. Chris tragically passed last December. And Chris was a wonderful Christian man that really believed in a lot of people, but specifically believed in what I was doing and helped us create our mission statement and helped us do so many things. Chris's answer to that dear younger me question was, he was part of a mentoring group in his twenties where the exercise was to read this book called The Principle of the Path by Andy Stanley. And in that book, there's this little exercise that they have where you write your own obituary. So I've asked many people this legacy question of if you were to help someone write your own obituary, or if you were having someone deliver your eulogy, and, and you could say, this, this is what I would really hope that they would say, what would you want your legacy to be either in a eulogy or an obituary, Kira? Yeah, that one. I actually do that exercise on my birthday every year, which sounds really morbid, saying it out loud. Oh, no, that's <laughs> amazing. I, I mean, it's like, it's a great annual experience. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm weird. I go get my teeth cleaned and my annual checkup and write my obituary. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, th for me, there's two elements. There, there's the elements with my children um, where I just really, it's important to me that they know that they were loved and supported and, and are accepted for who they are and yet are also held accountable for being greater than they think they're capable of. So, you know, I want to leave my children feeling that, that tension, right? Because it's like some parents push their kids so hard that they break and some parents love their kids so deeply that they fail. And it's like, I, I want to, balance that perfectly. <laughs> I, would, I would like to be known for balancing that perfectly. And then I think the, the extension of that to the world would be that I treat everyone like my children, right? <laughs> like that everybody just feels that, that they feel part of the family, that they feel that like maternal energy for me, that they feel protected and advocated for and seen the best in and accepted for who they are. Um, and that through that, we made a mark on the world that you could be incredibly successful. You could be wealthy. You could be uh, enriched and not at the cost of the things that really matter. Bingo. I mean, just mind blown. I just love it. Love it. Absolutely mm -hmm. love every part of this interview. Kira Golden, thank you for sharing your perspective for sharing your experiences. I know that there are so many and it's, it's fun because I have called a lot of our audience, the people, us that, that listen and benefit from this, Calibrate Calvin or Calibrate Cal. And, and I just love that. It's a little <laughs> bit of an homage to your son. And That's it's awesome. so great to see you. I mean, to be able to do this here from Denver and you're in Puerto Rico, I mean, what a cool experience. Yes. We've had a few guests that have been international and this has just been such a pinch me moment for me. So thank you for joining us today. I want to remind you. our podcast audience to share this screenshot it, share it on your Instagram, text message the link to someone. Of course, if you've listened and you've benefited, give us a five-star review. Say that Kira's advice really blessed you in some way. 
I absolutely love this audience. I love everything you guys are doing and we want to grow and continue. So the way we do that is by you sharing, rating, subscribing, et cetera. Kira Golden, my esteemed guest, two-timer now, episode 18 Yay. and episode 141. <laughs> Thank you for sharing uh, live from Puerto Rico. I love it. And as I love to say, Kira and I, we will see you around the neighborhood. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.